introducing the presenter for today, Sumit Dhar. Um, Sumit is a global head for risk resilience and InfoSec consulting at GFS, Havlet Packard. He's an engineering graduate from IIT Bombay and an MBA from ISB Hyderabad. He has over 15 years of leadership experience and has grown the current consulting practice at HP from scratch to a multi-million dollar service line. He's a well-known presenter on the international speaker circuit and his soft skills related presentations have been very well received by the senior leaders in large companies and at various MBA schools. He enjoys engaging the audience via interesting stories to highlight key lessons. So I hope you all are here to uh, understand how you, you would influence people in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's in the personal life or in the corporate life. So I hope you make full benefit of this session. And at the end, please don't forget to rate this session at your Convene app. So please do provide your feedback. That would help us to do much better in upcoming Grace Hopper conference sessions. Thank you. Over to Sunday. Morning, everyone. It's Morning. indeed indeed a pleasure and an honor to be over here. And uh, thank you for the introduction, Megna. Before I get started with my presentation, just want to highlight a couple of things. What I'm going to share with you over the next 60 minutes is really the result of research into this domain for the past decade or so. Right? The techniques, the principles that I'm going to share with you, they're not available easily in a single book, in a single article. So I genuinely hope what I share with you, you find it useful. The second thing that I want to share with you is that if you religiously apply these principles, you will all become powerful agents of influence. You will be able to persuade your managers, your uh, colleagues, your peers, and that group which is notoriously difficult to influence, your spouse and your children. <laughs> and the last part, I think uh, Meghna already alluded to it. Uh, I'm not going to share a dry, boring framework with you. What I'm going to do is share stories with you, stories from research, from psychology, from behavioral sciences, from economics. And via these stories, I'm hoping that we'll understand this puzzle of influence much better. Right? So before I get started with my stories, I do have a simple question, something that we may encounter in our working lives uh, often. And how we respond to that situation can define how influential we are. So here's a question. You have, you have two requests to make of your manager. Right? One request is reasonably large. You need $10,000 for a team event. The second request is small. You need $350 to start a team library. Now, how do you make these requests? There are certain options in front of you. And here are the options. Option one, you start off by making the large request first and then move to the smaller request. Option two, you start with the smaller request and then move to the larger request. And option three is, it really doesn't matter. Just make in any goddamn order. Now, how many of you will go with option one? Okay, I see a few hands. How many of you will go with option two? Okay, how many with option three? Okay, and how many of you have not raised your hands? <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Now, now the thing is this. Clearly, one of these options is right. The other option does not work as effectively. And this has been proven by science. Most of the times, what happens is when we are trying to influence others, when we are trying to persuade others, we don't know what is right and what is wrong. And because of that, end up doing something that's not right. I'm not going to give you the answer right away. But as we proceed into this presentation, I'm sure you'll know which of these options is right. So let me start off with my first story, the story of Drupik Brothers. Now, Drubeck Brothers ran a tailoring shop in old Chicago town. This is uh, around the time of depression. Businesses around them were failing, but Drubeck Brothers were doing exceedingly well. Why? So the reason for this was because they ran, the way they ran their operations. Now, what they did was when one of the customers walked into the shop, one of the brothers, Harry, would pretend to be deaf. So customer would say, do you have any suits? And what Harry would say is, eh, what did you say? Now, the customer would repeat his question louder. Do you have any suits? Harry would then take him to the section where they had suits, show him something. 
the customer would you know probably like one suit and say how much for this harry would again say eh what did you eh, no no problem maybe you can just take the call and let them know it's here yeah probably no problem no problem so harry would again pretend to be deaf and say what did you say the customer would repeat the question louder how much for the suit now harry would take the suit and call out to sid the other brother who was working in the different room and say sid how much for the suit sid would look up and say 60 dollars harry would again pretend to be deaf and say eh what did you say sid from the other room would repeat 60 dollars harry would then look at the customer without blinking his eyes say you heard him 16 dollars right now put yourself in the customer's shoe shoes if i was there i would grab the suit pay 16 dollars and get out of there <laughs> the truth of the matter was that suit probably cost 10 dollars now what really happened over here before we do that let's understand a little about how the human brain works now human brain is constantly inundated with information and human brain is a lazy muscle. It doesn't want to process this information again and again. So what does it do? It creates shortcuts. Now, when dealing with teenagers, for example, the human brain may have a shortcut. Teenagers are rebellious. So everything that a teenager does, human brain looks at it from that shortcut perspective. So these shortcuts are stereotypes. And there is a stereotype that we have in our brain, costly equates to good. So when the customers felt that they were getting a costly item, very cheap, they grabbed it without bargaining. And that's how Brubeck brothers were very successful. Now, this is an incorrect or unethical way of using influence techniques. But I thought I should share it with you before I go on to the next one, which is research by Professor Ellen Langer. Ellen Langer was a psychologist at Harvard, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And what she was doing was researching how easy it is for people to go ahead in a queue. So what Ellen Langer did was she divided her test subjects into two groups, one being the control group, the other being the experimental group. So she approached the people in the control group and said, may I please go ahead? They were waiting, all of them were waiting in a line for Xeroxing some sheets, and she said, may I please go ahead? 60% of the people agreed to her request, which means when she tried to influence them, 60% agreed to the request. Now, in the experimental group, what she did was she said, may I please go ahead because I'm in a hurry. The only difference between these two groups, they tried to equate the groups as far as possible. They had people with the same age group, same ethnicity, same gender, so on and so forth. The only difference between these two groups was in the second group, along with her request, she gave a justification. She gave a reason. And guess what happened? From 60%, the acceptance rate shot up to 94%. Now, this is a powerful principle, but when I read about it, I asked myself, do I regularly use this principle? And the answer, at least to me, was a big no. Because most of the times, I would make a request without providing a justification. While this is not one of the principles that I'm talking about, but I do want you to go back whenever you make a request of anyone, whether it's your boss, whether it's your peers, anyone at home, along with the request, do provide a reason, because it helps enhance the success rate you will have. All right, I've done this presentation at a lot of places, and often people believe that influence skills are something that are inherent. That is, you're born with these skills. But having read about this topic, I can assure you there's nothing that's farther from the truth. There are some easy to use principles that you can learn over a period of time and become influential using these principles. So let's dive straight into the principles. And the first principle that I want to talk about is called the principle of contrast. Now, uh, before I explain what this principle is, I just want uh, a simple thought experiment. Imagine your right hand is dipped in water at 20 degrees, all right? Your left hand is dipped in water at 50 degrees. You keep it there for some time, then pull both hands out and dip them in water at 35 degrees. Is the water hot or cold? Absolutely. There's someone raising a hand over there. Is there a query or a question or? You're not, I'm not audible? You can't hear. All right, 
let's let's have some people move to this side of the hall that will make it easier for the people over there yeah just a second let's let's do that let's move let's move people let's make it easy for the people entering over there yeah yes ma'am right Right. Now that's an interesting point you bring up and the point you're trying to make is that justifications are not effective. Okay. So I'll go back to the research Ellen Langer did. There was a third thing that she did and I didn't talk about it. What she said was, uh, there's another group she said, may I please go ahead because I want to Xerox these papers. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? That's not really a reason. Guess what happened in that case? 93% acceptance, which means the human brain is hardwired to receive inputs and especially if there's a because in that it automatically says that whatever follows that because is a reason so even if it's not a great reason you would scientifically be better off by providing it right and the other part of it is if someone is using this on you you can be cautious about it is this a real reason or is he just giving me some fluff right both ways of looking at it but the fact is human brain the moment it hears because it knows there's a reason following it, it stops processing it. And that's what the scientific research has shown. Right. Yes. Right. That's fine. See, the, the, what you should look at is, are you better off providing that reason or not? Fair enough. He might tell you that you're always providing a reason. but you might be better off providing that reason than not providing it, right? The comparison is between giving it or not giving it. And in that, I think providing a reason trumps, right? That's, that's what I would like to leave, uh, leave you with. All right, so let's move on to the first principle we are talking about contrast. So some of you over, said, over here said, one hand feels hot, the other hand feels cold. I mean, this is pretty obvious, we all know it. The reason I'm bringing this up is for a very simple, uh, uh, to highlight a very simple point. The fact is, human brain's response to the current situation can be tailored, can be tweaked, can be influenced by something you have experienced a few seconds, a few hours, or even a few days before the event, right? That's the contrast principle. How do people use it? Let's say you walk into a high-end retail store and you ask the clerk over there for a jacket and a pair of socks. What do you think they'll show you first? Absolutely. Do you know why? It's expensive. Once you have made up your mind a 10,000 rupee jacket, even if he sells you a pair of socks at 500 rupees, he'll be like, oh, it's so cheap. Let me buy it. But the other way around, if he shows you a pair of socks at 200 rupees and then tries to sell you a jacket of 5,000, 5, it appears expensive. And the same principle is used in a lot of industries. In retail, uh, sorry, in real estate, if you go to a broker, uh, you'll very clearly define what you're looking for in terms of the house, the neighborhood, the rent, etc. But invariably, the first house they will show you will be crappy. The house will be bad in a bad neighborhood and exorbitantly priced. Next, he will show you the real house that he wants to sell, the one that is just right for you, but it will be 25% more expensive than what you had indicated to him. Because of the contrast principle, what happens is this house suddenly starts looking much more attractive. Right? So all this is fine. This is what we have seen from industry, uh, uh, from real estate, from uh, retail. Has anyone else used it? And over here, I want to share a beautiful example from The Economist. Now, Economist has a page where they talk about their subscriptions, right? And they have two options. The first option is uh, a web-only subscription online model where you pay $59 for it. The second option is where you get a print version of the magazine and access to the online portal. So print and online both, that's around $125. Now, the management and economist was very clear. They wanted people to go with option two because they make more money over there. But unfortunately, what was happening was people were going with option one, right? Roughly 30% of all the people were going with option two, which was not good for them. They wanted to change it. Guess what they did? Here's what they did. Their option page, their uh, subscription page read something like this. Online, 59. Print, 125. Because of the contrast principle, what happened? This option started looking very attractive. From 30% subscriptions to this option went up to close to 
So that's the power of the contrast principle and how people have used it. Another thing I'll do is I'll share with you the principles, I'll share with you how people have used it. Unfortunately, I cannot give you a solution to how you can use it. What will have to happen is you'll have to internalize these principles and whenever you're facing a situation where you have to influence someone, quickly run through the principles and see which one can I use, all right? So that was the principle, first principle contrast. Let's move on to the next one, which is called reject, retreat, and repeat. It's a very simple principle. It sounds a uh, little fancy, but the principle is very simple. What the principle says is you start off by making a large request, right? In all probability, it might be rejected. Fair enough. Don't bargain, don't negotiate, don't haggle. Instead, move on to a smaller request. The probability that the smaller request will get accepted is much higher. If you follow this order, the probability that the smaller request will get accepted is much higher than if you were to make the small request directly. All right. So let's see this via an example how it really works. Now, uh, the experiment that I want to share with you is something done by Professor Robert Cialdini. He's from the Arizona State University. He's an expert on this topic, and here's what he did. Uh, he wanted to evaluate if people would be willing to agree to his request, where he wanted them to take care of certain juvenile delinquents over the weekend. What he did, like all good experimenters, divided the subjects, which were college students, into two groups. First group, he approached them directly and said, will you take care of these juvenile delinquents over the weekend? Now, if you were to ask me, most probably I would say no, this is not something I'm interested in. But somehow, 17% of the students agreed. They said, sure, we'll do it. Now what Professor Cialdini did with group two was interesting. He approached these students and said, over the next 52 weekends, can you take care of these juvenile delinquents? So basically their whole year, they were taking care of the juvenile delinquents on the weekend. Now, as you can expect, 0% agreed to this large request. What Cialdini did was immediately went to the second request. Okay, if not for the whole year, how about the coming weekend? A much smaller request, and guess what happened? In the first case for this request, there were 17% people who agreed, but in this case, 54% of the students agreed, a jump of 200%. So this is reject, retreat, repeat principle. How is it used in the industry? Right, this is fine in research, they have done it. Is it used anywhere in the industry? Now, some of you are pretty young, you might not know it, but there was a time when uh, encyclopedia salesmen would come knocking on our doors, right? Uh, I've, I've gone through that phase, so I can tell you about it. They'll start off with, okay, here's whatever encyclopedia they're selling, Britannica, 26 volumes, A to Z. Would you like to buy the whole set? You're not interested in it, you say no. Fair enough, he's not dissuaded. If not A to Z, how about A to E, just five volumes? From a big request, he has come down to a smaller request. Some people may agree to it, some people would say no. Fair enough, even if someone said no, he would come down to an even smaller request. Fair enough, let's not go with all the five volumes. How about just one volume for the letter A, right? Some people at this point would agree, that's great for him. If they didn't agree, he had an even smaller request. If you're not buying anything, can you at least recommend a friend who might be interested? So they had a script which used this principle to influence their potential buyers. So the same principle is used by telecallers often, right? And the group that is really good at using this, any ideas? Children, absolutely. I have a four-year-old who uses this day in and day out with me, and I know this principle, and I fall a prey to it. <laughs> I know this, but I still fall a prey to it. There are two lovely cartoons I got. Uh, one is from Dennis, and the other is from Calvin and Hobbes. I know people towards the end, you might not be able to read it. Let me tell you what's happening. Dennis asks his mom, tells his mom, if I can't have a horse, can I at least have a cookie? <laughs> right? Horse, large request, cookie, smaller request. And mom falls a prey to it. And mom says, oh my goodness, that's the least I can do for you. Here's a cookie. And Dennis walks away smiling to himself saying, who would have thought an invisible horse worth its weight in cookies? <laughs> So this is the reject, retreat, repeat principle. Another example, uh, I'm sure a lot of you over here would love Calvin and Hobbes. So Calvin uh, shouts out, mom, can I set fire to the mattress? <laughs> Whoa. Mom says, no, Calvin, you can't. Then he comes up with the second large request. Can I ride the tricycle on the roof? <laughs> mom says, no. And then he comes with smaller request. Then can I have a cookie? <laughs> and mom says, no, Calvin, you can't. And Calvin walks away, damn, she's on to me. <laughs> so this is 
the reject, retreat, repeat principle. Simple, but how do you use it? Now, every time you're going to your manager with a single request, think of a possibility where he says no to that request, have a smaller request ready. <laughs> have a smaller request ready. I'm telling you a personal example. I worked with a gentleman around uh, 10 years back. This guy had outlandish ideas about what he wanted in a presentation. And my first response to that was, no, that's not possible. Then he would come back with a much smaller request, which I know had he made that request directly, I would have still said no. But given that I had said no already to the first request, I ended up saying yes. Right? So when you're going to your manager, when you're going to a peer, when you're going to your juniors with a request, always have a fallback. If he or she says no, there is a smaller request that I need to have. All right? A quick quiz. You have a store that sells billiard tables. The cost ranges from $300 to $3,000. A gentleman walks in and he wants to purchase a billiards table. You have two options as to how you can sell the billiards table to the gentleman. Option one, you start big. Start with the $3,000 table first and slowly go down. Option two, start small. $300 first and go up. How many of you will go with option one? That is, sorry, sorry, sorry. The options actually here are reversed. Start small, go big. Option two is start big, go small. How many of you will go with option one? Okay. How many of you will go with option two, which is start at the larger? Okay. Now, that, that's the right answer, incidentally. Now, the reason this question is interesting is because they ran it as a science experiment. They ran it for some time in a shop, and they said, let's, let's find out what's the average price with these two options. When you start small, when you start at $300, your average sale price, yes, ma'am. Yes. So sometimes it happens with me also. Like you mm -hmm. go to a retail store and you say, oh, do you have uh, X, yeah. you have that uh, float or something? Yeah. That sure. Is. And he suddenly says, oh, it's 10,000. And he starts showing me 10,000. Oh, then I make up my mind, oh, this, this store looks to be really, really costly and get out of it without yes. even asking. Oh, sure. You have a small. That's a risk. Isn't it when you, absorb, when you increase the price? Sure. Right. And the customer will just walk, walk out. out. He will not even listen to you. Absolutely. Okay. That is a risk. Now the question is how do you balance that risk? Yeah. Right? What science tells us, it's better to start larger. They evaluated all the responses and they averaged it out. In 3000, when they started with 3000, there would be customers who have walked out. Right? There would certainly be customers who have walked out because their price point was maybe 500. They felt that the store is more expensive. Right? It's also on how you position it. You might say, we'll start off with this. Here's the table. It's got whatever fancy finish, etc. But we also have tables which are a little ex less expensive. So you could do that. But the fact is, these things have been considered when the experiment was done. And in spite of people walking out, what they found was when you started at 3000 your average sale price was $1,000. When you started at 300 your average sale price was $550. Right? So if I were to go, I mean, I'm talking about myself as a person. I know my gut instinct is bad. I would rather go with what data tells me, right? Data tells me it's better to do this. Sure enough, I'll go with it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but this online portals like Jabong or anything, they always start with uh, from small to big. They never go the other way. No, you're given an option. You can filter it by small to high, high to small. You have an option. By default, it always shows small to small. So the interesting thing would be, an interesting experiment would be for Jabong to run a kind of test where half of their visitors, they show prices low to high, half they show high to low, and figure out where their average sales are higher. Okay. I wish they did. It could be on the higher side for that category. Yeah, sure. Could be. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure how many of them really are bothered about profits right now. A lot of e-commerce companies seem to be bleeding. I don't know if they're even bothered about uh, margins, profits.
they are bothered about user experience and gross merchandise value. So yeah, there could be different uh, factors at play over here. I'll take one more comment. I saw the lady over there raise a hand. I think they're more about customer acquisition more than rather than really increasing their sales. All right. In the interest of time, what I'll do is, uh, and I'll be happy to spend some time with anyone who has follow-up questions. I just want to make sure I complete this on time because it's, I think, lunch after this. Yes. All right. So we uh, we saw that starting big, moving on to something smaller is beneficial from an inference perspective. Next, what I want to talk about is a principle called reciprocity. Very simply put, what this principle says is that humans as a species tend to repay favors. You're more likely to agree to someone's request if they have done you a favor in the past, right? And what is the impact? So over here, I have an interesting experiment conducted by Professor Dennis Regan. So what Dennis Regan and his colleagues did, they conducted an experiment where they invited volunteers for a art exhibition workshop. So every volunteer that came was paired up with an assistant from the laboratory. And what they did was they walked around an art exhibition looking at the painting, so on and so forth. Halfway through, the assistant from the laboratory excused himself and walked out. And after some time, came back with a can of Coke. In the first group, he came back with a can of Coke for himself. And then at the end of the experiment, tried to sell raffle tickets for charity to the volunteer, right? In the second group, what they did was the gentleman walked out, the assistant walked out, got a can of Coke for himself and a can of Coke for the other volunteer, handed it over to him. And at the end of the exhibition, again tried to sell raffle tickets. So what they found was the increase between the two groups, the place where reciprocity was built up by giving a small can of Coke the increase in the sale of raffle tickets was close to 300%. So what this tells us, and I think all of us intuitively know this, is if people owe you favors, they will agree to requests that you have to make. And when I complete the next one, just remind me, there's an interesting research about how this may not be as effective for women, which was surprising when I read it. I, in fact, read it last week, research by Professor Adam Grant, which says when women do favor for their male colleagues, it's kind of expected, you know, it's, uh, it's not given, and this is very surprising, this is very surprising. From what I have been reading, from what my wife tells me, she's working, she tells me about her experiences and, you know, what I've heard today, I can see there's a lot of difference in perspectives. I have a different perspective as a male, you have a different perspective as, a fem as females, and research says this, when women uh, do something good for their male colleagues, the reciprocity that is built up is not as high as if a male colleague were to have done the same favor. So I'll talk about how do you deal with that. Now, the other example I have, this was from research. Let's move on to the real world. And over here, I want to share an example uh, without any offense to people who believe in ISKCON, uh, how ISKCON very effectively used this principle. So what ISKCON wanted to do was, it wanted to collect donations and it was doing this in the US. How they did this was as follows. Their volunteers would stand right outside the airports and when the passengers disembarked and came out, the volunteers would approach the passengers with a red rose, hand it over to the passenger and say, sir, this is from ISKCON. The passenger would accept the rose and say, thank you. The moment passenger accepted the rose, reciprocity was built up. And bam, that's the point where this guy would whip out a checkbook and say, sir, can you please donate to ISKCON? <laughs> At this point, where the person has just accepted a nice red rose, said thank you, saying no to this request was close to impossible. The story doesn't end over here. So over a period of time, passengers obviously grew wise to what ISKCON is doing. So what they would do is they would take the flower, not say thank you, leave it on the floor and walk away. Right? No reciprocity, no donations. But then ISKCON couldn't keep quiet. They had to do something about this. They were losing donations. So what ISKCON did was they replaced the red rose with an American flag. And patriotic Americans found it so difficult to place the flag on the floor and walk away. <laughs> Thank you, and can you donate to ISKCON? So this went on, this game of cat and mouse went on for some time till ISKCON was banned from soliciting donations at American airports. <laughs> now, an interesting story, uh, there was a researcher who was observing the whole thing. While they were still in that rose phase, he would observe that these ISKCON guys, after every one hour or so, they would rush out for a couple of minutes. They followed them to see what they were doing. Guess what they were doing? They were going to the dustbins where the Passengers were throwing the roses, picking them up again, and circulating it. All right, so that's the 
that is the principle of reciprocity being misused in some sense. And I said I will talk about uh, uh, women and reciprocity. Now, let us say you have done a favor to a colleague, right? And he says, thank you, I really appreciate this. What is your normal response? Welcome, okay. It is okay, it is okay, no problems and any time and those are all wrong responses. I do not share this when I am doing a presentation with guys because that you know, uh, I have done something for you, you owe me is inherently there. But after reading this research, I realized that it might not be the case for women. So when, and I did a little additional research on this, when someone says thank you, do not say no problem. Instead say something like this, I am sure you would have done the same thing if I needed your help. <laughs> right? So, you have done them a favor, you have clearly told them that you have done them a favor and you expect sometime later there will be repayment. Now, there is one important point I want to raise over here. This is a powerful principle. This is a powerful principle and throughout this presentation, I will raise this point. There is a very thin line differentiating influence from manipulation, right? It has to be done ethically. Let us not misuse any of these principles, but if you are looking at reciprocity, do favors well in advance of a request that you are making. Do not do it, you know, oh, tomorrow I need this guy to do this for me. Let me do something for him today. That will not work. Right? So, that is the reciprocity principle at work and from reciprocity, let me move on to the next principle which is a powerful one called social validation. And now, social validation is nothing complex, it is something very simple. What it says is humans are genetically hardwired to do what others around them are doing. Right? If a group of friends are all drinking Pepsi or Coke, it is unlikely one of them will be eating a banana, <laughs> right? So, you are, you are more likely to do what others around you are doing and social validation uses this hardwiring of the human brain. Over here, what I want to do is share an experiment conducted uh, by Albert Bandura. He is considered one of the greatest living psychologists of our times and what he did was he used the principle of social validation to cure phobia in children. Now, the conventional methods that were being used at that time had a success rate of around 10 percent. What did Professor Banduras do which was different? So, what he did was parents would get to him children, let us say they were afraid of dogs, right? Let us just take an example that the, uh, the children were afraid of dogs. So, what uh, Banduras did was it was a multi-step process. In the first step, he would show them videos. He would show them videos of other kids, their age, their ethnicity, just like them playing with dogs. What is he trying to do? Convey a message, playing with dogs is not frightening, puppies are not frightening, dogs are not frightening. The second step, he would take them to a playground where other kids around the same age were playing with dogs, right? And the third step, he took them into a playpen where other kids were doing the same. So, consistently in each step of the process, what he did was drove home a single message that other kids who are just like you they have no fear of dogs. At the end of this process, 70 percent of the kids, okay, the number is not there, 70 percent of the kids were cured of their phobia, right? And there is a huge improvement from 10 percent to 70 percent using the principle of social validation. At times, I have done it with my kid, uh, eat vegetables, all your friends are doing it and I have seen it work, right? So, those of you who have kids, try it out sometime, maybe it will work. It is in some sense because I will tell you what happened. When we were, uh, uh, we were still cavemen, if we saw all our other cavemen moving in a particular direction, you also started following that. Otherwise, you ended up being food for a tiger, right? So, what nature has done is somehow it has hardwired this behavior. See what others are doing, follow it, right? Maybe you can call it comparison, but I would say it is a hardwired behavior. Now, let me put it this way. How many of you clap while no one else is clapping? Have you tried? It feels embarrassing, you know? Oops. When everyone else is clapping, it's a social validation of the act you are performing. You feel much more comfortable, right? And the same goes for other things too, right? So if you can use social validation at work, for instance, let's say you're trying to drive a project with your management, right? Obviously, you, sh you talk about the benefits, the advantages, etc. But very subtly, also let them know, 
other business units like yours, other companies like yours, other organizations like yours have already done this. So what does it convey to the management that people are already doing this? This is the safe thing to do. The chances, I'm not saying you'll have 100% success. None of these give you a 100% rate of success. But what they do is enhance significantly the potential or the probability of your success. Right? And talking about potential of success, I do want to share an interesting uh, uh, activity that was done by Alex Lasky. The video is there on TED. You can look him up. It's a fantastic experiment. So this is around 10 years back, and California was having a severe power shortage. So Alex Lasky and his team wanted to encourage people to save power. So what did they do? They, took 20, they uh, targeted a locality called San Marcos. And over there, what they said was 25% of the houses, let's deliver a message around saving money. So they gave them flyers, pamphlets, leaflets, which said, switch off ACs and fans when you don't need them. Save power. Right? So money was the motivating factor in 25% of the houses. Another 25%, they said, uh, creating energy impacts the environment. Save electricity, switch off AC, switch off fan, and save the environment. So that was a message they gave to another 25% of, uh, of the houses. And in the third case, the 25% uh, houses, they said, be a good citizen. Save power, help others. So three different messages. Guess which message was more? Save money, be a good citizen. OK, let me put it this way. When I read about it, I thought save money would be effective. I mean, what can be better than hard, cold cash, right? Third one, guess what? Guess what? None of these worked. <laughs> this would not be an interesting story if it ended over here. There was another 25% houses where they had a different message. The message said 77% of households like yours have saved electricity by switching off their ACs and uh, fans. Won't you join them? What was the message? Others around you who are similar to you have been doing it. And the households, the 25% households that received this message, they decreased their electricity consumption by close to 22%, right? A huge number. They did this on a much larger scale after that, and the result was this. $250 million in terms of electricity bills, two terawatts of power saved completely, all using social validation. Right? And another place where you will, yes, ma'am. Maybe. Maybe in some cases it does, but what they found was social validation was most effective. Right? Uh, let me put it this way. If you're poor, you're already consuming electricity at a level that you're comfortable with. If it was going beyond your budget, you would have probably cut it down already. Right? So I'm assuming it's at a level where they are comfortable with it. And in that scenario, social validation is what Alex proved worked for people. Right? Now, uh, one place where you will see it very often, even in India, is when you look at tip jars. They're always filled with money. The reason is, others have done it. Are you doing it? Right? I have seen this personally when I was at uh, MBA college. There was, I'll not go into the details. But this principle worked effectively because we are collecting some donations for Chennai tsunami victims. And, and this principle worked. Right? And if you look at advertisements, what do they tell you? The largest selling. That means everyone else is buying this product. The fastest growing, everyone else is looking at this product. right? If they're targeting youth, yeah, he had right choice, baby, or whatever that Yangistan ad was there. I don't even remember. The only thing I related to was when they called him uncle, and I could, OK, this is probably not my, my demographic. So, <laughs> so the thing that I'm trying to say is advertisers use this frequently. right? And it is an effective principle. The thing we need to think is, how do we use it at our workplaces. So there were a couple of examples that I shared with you. Next time you have a situation where you have to influence someone, maybe it's your peer, it's your manager, think, is there a way I can use social validation in this, in this scenario? Right? From social validation, I'll move on to what I personally believe. Yes, I'm sorry. Before I do that, there's a question over here. They want to be different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
okay. So one group that always wants to be different is teenagers, right? Have you seen teenagers? They'll have spiky hair, colored one side, red on this, green on that side, right? They're trying to be different. But have you noticed, if you look at teenagers, they're all trying to be the same. It is the comparison. Yeah, they end up. That's because they're not conforming to your social validation. They are conforming to what others in their similar category are doing. Now, if your boss says, nah, I don't agree with it, I don't think, that's probably because we are not using the right comparison group. Maybe it's other managers like him. What are they doing, right? Could be. I'm not saying that is the solution. Like, I'll say for everything over here, I am not in a position to spoon feed you a direct answer. I'm just exploring possible options, right? Yes, ma'am. Could be, could be, right? It has to be explored what works. But the thing is this, even with the children, the phobia experiment, if you look at it very carefully, he compared or showed them videos of children of their age group, right? Of children who are very similar to them. So it's important to get that comparison with the right group, right? So, yes ma'am. I agree with you. I mean, my wife is not here. She was planning to come here. I would have agreed with you. It's, it's, no, but jokes apart, jokes apart, uh, it is how they are applied. And what I said, none of the techniques will guarantee 100% of results. Maybe not this technique, maybe the next technique works, right? The objective is at the end of it, you have an arsenal of five to 10 techniques which are effective. And depending on the environment, depending on the condition, depending on the spouse's mood, you probably try one of those. Right? So there are there are differences. For example, while I was reading upon it, reciprocity, it's not as effective for women. I, I hadn't thought of this, right? Uh, reciprocity, reciprocity is much more effective in the Western cultures than it is in Asian cultures. Okay, that's interesting. Because there are these nuances, there are these differences, but the objective, the, the fact is they are effective. They are much better than not using these techniques. The only thing that we need to consider at the end is of these six or seven things that I have in front of me, which one I do, do I use to make it most effective? So maybe with spouses, this may not work. The next one that we are going to talk about, probably that works, right? Which, which brings me nicely to the next one that I want to talk about, the commitment and consistency principle. Now, of all the techniques, if there is one that I would say is the most powerful, it's this technique. Now, what does this technique say? say? This technique says something very simple. If a person has committed to a thought or an idea, later on, when you make a request that is aligned to that thought or an idea, they will act consistent with their commitment. And you're likely to get an acceptance for such a thought. Now, that's quite a mouthful what I said. Let me illustrate it with an example. And over here, what I want to do is share an experiment done by Professor Sherman. He was asked by American Cancer Society to help them collect donations. So like any good professor of behavioral sciences of psychology, what he did was he took the list of potential donors, divided them into two nice groups. The first group being the control group, the second group being the experimental group. He approached the control group bluntly, will you donate to American Cancer Society? Certain percentage of people said yes, others said no. Fair enough. So he got that number. Then he approached the experimental group. And what he did with them was, he started off by saying, do you support the work that's done by American Cancer Society? Right? Not wanting to be uncharitable, almost everyone said, yes. yes, fair enough, that's it, nothing beyond that. He called them a couple of days later. If American Cancer Society needed some help, would you provide that help, some small help? Again, what did people say? Yes. So what he had done with these two calls, it, he, is he had built a commitment to a cause. Right? He had got them to commit to a cause. And then the third call that he made was, he said, will you donate to American Cancer Society? Right? Now, compared to the first group, the increase in this group, it was not 10%, not 20%, not 100%. It was a whooping 700%. Right? Just by using the power of commitment and consistency. That's from research. That's from uh, what scientists have done in the lab. Let's look at one real life business example. And here I want to share the story of a restaurant that had a problem with unannounced dropouts. So what people would do 
at this restaurant, they would call and reserve a table. So maybe I'll call the restaurant and say I want a table for two or a table for three at eight o'clock tonight. Fair enough. The table would be reserved from eight to eight thirty in my name. Now there were cases where people would not turn up. That was roughly thirty-eight percent. So thirty-eight percent of the telecalled reservations would not turn up. Now why was this a problem for the restaurant? Because from eight to eight thirty there were people waiting outside, and after some time they would get dejected and they would walk away. So they were losing business. What they did was they called some compliance experts, people who look at these scenarios and say how better they can structure their processes to get this number to go down. And what the compliance expert found was something very interesting. He said, "Your process is fine. Uh, towards the end, what I notice is your receptionist says this." So what the receptionist said was, "Please call if you have to cancel your reservation." Right? That's what the receptionist said. The compliance expert said, "I don't want you to change your process. I want you to add just two words to this statement. Just two words." Any ideas? Don't call. Don't call. No, certainly. Sorry. If you okay, so a little bit of a threat, right? Okay, I'll tell you what the compliance expert said. He said, "Don't change your process. Don't do anything. Just add these two words to your statement. Instead of please call, make it will you please call if you have to cancel your reservation." What happens when you say this is? It's a question. And what does the other person say? Yes. And they have given a small level of. Verbal commitment, right? And what happened as a result of this verbal commitment is, from 38 percent, their unannounced dropouts fell to close to 6 percent, just by two words, and 100 million dollars that they probably paid to the compliance expert, <laughs> right? So, yes, ma'am. That's of yes. That's that's also same. Yep. Yes. Yes, you could do that. You could do that. Absolutely. So, uh, this was probably, you know, without having them. I don't know if they were short-staffed or they had problems. They didn't have to follow up, right? This was just a simple thing, and it worked. See, the thing about a lot of these experiments or a lot of these approaches is, you test it out, works, great. If it doesn't, then you try something of this sort, right? Till you hit a mechanism that is effective for you, right? And yes, yes, ma'am. He'll be aware. He's yeah. Is trying to manipulate you. Sure. Is trying to influence you using these techniques. Sure. Could be aware. Yeah. Right. Are aware. Yeah. So the thing is this. Uh, may I know your name? Momina. So the thing is this. Uh, my experience and what I have read says this: If you use these principles in the proper manner, without trying to manipulate people, they will not refuse you a favor if you use them properly. But if the only objective you have is to manipulate them when you need them, yes, they will. They will have a short life frame, right? Uh, what I can do is separately share with you some examples where. These principles have repeatedly been used, and yet they were effective because that's the way our human brain is hardwired, right? So even if we want to, we cannot say no. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember it, but there was a fantastic uh, example in Friends. So there's a lady who calls up, uh, uh, I think Jennifer, and says, uh, "Can you meet me tomorrow?" Jennifer says, "No." Can you meet me day after? Jennifer says, "No." She keeps on saying no for a lot of things, and finally the lady says, "How about we meet today, right now?" And Jennifer ends up saying yes and bang for it. So, I don't remember the name of the other lady. Say they say what happened? She said I knew that I would end up saying yes because I had said so many no's. So she knew the fact. It's a it's a uh, funny example because it comes from a comedy uh, serial. The fact is we may know it, but the way human brain is hardwired, we still we may not be able to help it. But again, I'll go back to the point I said earlier. Use them in an ethical manner. If you try to use them only for manipulation, rest assured, very soon you'll have people 
who will say no to you even if you are using these techniques. And towards the end, I will talk a little about the difference between influence and manipulation. All right. So, we were at commitment and consistency and I think it is a right time to have a quick question. Now, here is a question. You are interviewing with two companies that are typically uh, considered equivalent to each other, probably rivals, let us say Unilever and PNG. Now, what should you do? Should you let both the hiring managers know that you are interviewing with a competitor or should you keep quiet about it? You never know how they may take it. And there is a third option obviously that it does not matter. How many of you would let the hiring manager and especially the objective is to increase your chances of getting hired at either of them, right? How many of you would uh, go with, I will let the managers know? Wow. <laughs> How many of you would, uh, would not let the hiring managers know? Okay. Now, the right answer to this is, it is to your advantage, not always, but in most of the cases to let the hiring managers know that you are interviewing with a competitor. And the reason for that, one is social validation that others like my company are looking at him as a potential candidate. The other is something called the scarcity principle. Now, what is the scarcity principle? Scarcity principle is very simple. As humans, we value something that is scarce, that is not easily available, right? So, the example that I want to share of this principle being used is where a company that sold beef to retail stores used a psychologist to see how they could jack up their sales. So, what the psychologist did was he called up the retail stores, divided them into the standard two groups, control and the experimental group. And in the control group, he said, we have this high quality European beef, blah, 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 top notch quality, value for money, cheap, so on and so forth. The retail stores placed a certain amount of order, X kgs from the company. In the second case, what he did was, he said, we've got this high quality beef, value for money, et cetera, et cetera. And then he introduced a twist. He said, beef is going to be short supply in the very near future because of mad cow disease in Europe, right? introduced scarcity. And after that, he said, this information that there is a outbreak of mad cow disease, it is not known either. So, not only was beef going to be scarce, the information that it was going to be scarce itself was scarce. And what they found was, what they found was between group 1 and group 2, the increase was 6, oh sorry, I have not moved to the next slide. The, the increase was 600 percent more was ordered in group 2, right? Absolutely, it's, it's all, no matter when you go to them, it's always the last flat that they have available. How do you counter that? If they are using scarcity, you use the reverse. Oh, that's fine. You're talking to three other builders. They seem to have attractive properties. Let's have a look at what you have. All of a sudden, they'll have new flats available, <laughs> right? So how do you counter sc scarcity is also important. And this is surge pricing. It's, it'll come back to, it'll come back to normal. It'll come back to normal. Though in, Uber's case, I'm willing to believe that it is more algorithmic rather than deliberate manipulation. In real estate, I'm 100% sure it is manipulation. It's, it's anyone from real estate over here? No, thankfully, thankfully. All right. So from, from studies in lab, let me move on to a real world example. How do you create scarcity? No, no, I'm, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. So you do what you do with the real estate guys. There are three other companies that are talking to me. No, I'm, yeah, uh, jokes aside. But the fact is, if the scarcity is there are only so many limited slots, and I do this sometimes when my team members have to be promoted, and I get this message that there are only so many limited slots. I said the market is very hot. With their caliber, they'll get a job like this. All of a sudden, a few additional slots do open up. They do open up, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. True. True, it is. And uh, you will have to take a call. What kind of a manager do you have? Is he the kind who will appreciate the fact that your skills, your capabilities, your leadership is in demand? Or is he the kind who will feel insecure and say, oh my God, this person is about to leave. Let me find a replacement. That call only you can take. Right? There are managers who are very confident, know that their people are in great demand and go out of their way to help them. How a manager will react, it really depends on your reading of the situation. All right. In the interest of time, we have two more techniques to cover. So let me uh, talk about the scarcity principle. And the example I have 
is from a beautiful book called Shackleton's Way. It's a wonderful book on leadership. It's not too thick. It's around 150, 160 pages. I would strongly recommend everyone read it. It's a fantastic read. Now, Shackleton was trying to be the first person to reach the Antarctica. And as luck would have it, while trying this journey, their ship got stuck in an ice floe. Now, when that happens, there are a lot of cases that it had happened in the past, and invariably, the captains lost some seamen. And it was due to a disease called scurvy, which happens due to deficiency of vitamin C. C. Now, the place where they were that had a very good source of vitamin C, that was seal meat. But there was a problem. Seal meat tastes lousy. And Shackleton knew it. If he asked the sailors to eat that seal meat, none of them would eat it. Now, Shackleton was a very fair man. He always believed that even if someone is a sailor, someone is a captain, he would treat them very fairly. But Shackleton at this point did something that was totally unlike him. What he did was he put up a notice saying that seal meat available to captain and above 25 grams on the weekend. There were seals that you could see all around the horizon. But he put a rule that 25 grams only on the weekend, a certain level and above. Now, having treated his sailors very fairly every time, they were shocked at this, uh, at this notice. They all kind of uh, got together and approached Shackleton and said, this is not fair. We need this. He said, no, no, you guys will waste it. It's very precious. They said, no, no, we'll not waste it. He got a commitment from them that none of them would waste even a single gram of seal meat. And he said, if I see someone wasting it, I'll cut this privilege out. Not a single gram of seal meat was wasted. Not a single death in Shackleton's team. Not a single death. At the same time, I believe Amundsen was trying to reach uh, Antarctica, and he had four sailors who died due to scurvy. So this was a use of the scarcity principle in real life. So from scarcity, let me quickly move on to the last principle. And I want to do a quick time check. How much time do we have? Five minutes? Perfect. So authority principle is something that we'll all inherently understand. If someone in authority makes a request, we are more likely to agree to it. right? Now, what is the level of agreement that we will have to a person in authority asking us something? Here's where the Milgram experiment comes into place. What Stanley Milgram did was he asked for volunteers for a memory test. So people volunteered. He gave them a list of long list of words that they had to memorize. So on one side sat a student volunteer who would memorize this list. On the other side sat a teacher volunteer. Now teacher volunteer had access to a device like this. What did this device do? It was connected via electrodes to the student volunteer. Whenever the person, after memorizing the list, made a mistake in the order, this gentleman would flip a switch and the first shock would be of 5 volts. <laughs> Second mistake, 10 volts. So on and so forth till 450 volts. Now, whenever a teacher volunteer said, no, I'm not going to do this, because you don't want to give an electric shock to another human being, right? There would be a person in authority who would come there and say, no, go ahead, do it. Right? Now, imagine yourself as a teacher volunteer. How many of you would not give even a single shock? Okay. How many of you would go up to 50, but not beyond 50, 50 volts? Okay. A couple. How many of you would go all the way up to 100? No one. 200, 250, 300. Anyone who will go all the way up to 450? Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. What Stanley Milgram found was almost everyone, when told by a person in authority to give the shock, gave up to 300 volts without hesitation. Right? These were old grannies who had probably baked cookies for their grandchildren half an hour before. Up to 300, they happily gave that shock. Sorry, happily is the wrong word to use, but they did give the shock. And there were a significant proportion of people who went all the way up to 450 volts. So what Milgram concluded is that a person in authority wields enormous power. And when Nazis said that we did it because we were ordered to the Nuremberg trials, they were actually not mistaken, because when a person in authority makes a request, people do agree to it. Right? Now, uh, I'll share one more interesting story, then talk about how do we showcase authority even when the person might not be reporting to us, and close after that. So the story I have, I'll end on a slightly amusing note. What they found in uh, hospitals in the US, the nurses were often as knowledgeable as the doctors. They knew what medicines were to be given, how they were to be administered, so on and so forth. Now, there was this interesting case that compliance experts found that a patient went to a doctor.
doctor with pain in his right ear. So, the doctor looked at it, found there was a minor infection, gave some ointment. So, the doctor on the prescription wrote whatever the name of the ointment was, Socradex, two drops, R space ear. Right? The nurse reads it, Sofradex, she knows it is an ear ointment, she knows the person is suffering from ear pain, two drops in the rear. She turned the patient over, gave him the two drops. That was the power of authority. It is amusing, but the fact is when someone from in a position of authority may ask us to do something which is patently stupid, people still do it. Right? And very quickly, how do you showcase authority? What are some of the things that help showcase authority? So, researchers have said a couple of things. One, the attire that you wear. Right? They have found that people will willingly commit crime when being led by someone in a suit and formal trousers. The probability of someone committing a crime is higher. So, the crime was simple as jaywalking in the US. So, when a person in normal jeans, uh, jeans tried to cross the street, X percentage followed him. But when it was a consultant wearing a suit and uh, uh, tie, a larger percentage followed him. Right? So, the dress that you wear conveys authority. Second thing is knowledge. The knowledge that you have again conveys authority. Titles, if you are a PhD, do not hesitate to put doctor in front of your, in front of your name. It conveys authority. Right? So, these were the seven principles. I will quickly summarize them starting with Ellen Langer's uh, principle of justification, the principle of contrast, reject, retreat, repeat principle, social validation, commitment and consistency, scarcity, authority and I have not talked about liking. You tend to do things for people that you like anyway. So, I have not talked about that principle. So, these are the principles that I would request you to keep in mind. Whenever you have a situation where you have to use influence, look at these. And what I have done is once you get the slide deck, I have also listed the references that you can use. So, these are the references that I used for preparing the presentation. Fascinating read. Some of them are available freely. Some of them you might need to buy, but all of them are interesting reads. So, with that, I will end with a request and a hope. The request is this. I will, the presentation will be shared with all of you. Do not worry. You want the references? Let me just complete and I will leave it at that because I am running short of time. So, I will end with a request and a hope. The request I have is this. These are powerful principles. right? Make sure you use them ethically. Do not use them for manipulation. Instead, use them for influencing people. And the hope I have is all of you, all the people I see in the room, uh, ladies from across different companies, all of you become powerful agents of persuasion at your workplace. With that hope, with that request, I will end this session. I will be open to any questions that you might have. Thank you. References, all right. That is a good point. I will leave it at that. Oops. Can you just go to the last slide, please? Please blow it up. Thank you. You'll all get your copy of references. Thank you so much for the wonderful session that you had today. I think yeah. this example tried to implement this, some of the techniques in an ethical way. Uh, Hopefully, yeah. Thank you so much. Hopefully. Thank you. 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 Thank you